Hello, Stumble and beyond. My name is Ed Howler, and welcome to the Stumble Labor Show. We're going to be continuing to air our show remotely during the COVID-19 crisis as we bring you guests that we believe will educate our viewers. And you can always find us on YouTube. You can find us on Channel 3 um, uh, in Somerville. And uh, after nearly two months of the stay-at-home advisory and safe distancing, uh, what, what have we learned during this uh, pandemic? Uh, the disproportionate way that the very contagious virus that attacks the very vulnerable, lower income populations, elderly nursing homes, uh, people of uh, black and brown, Latino, uh, this has really compromised uh, their immune deficiencies, uh, people who have that. Uh, in most recent interviews, we discovered that our healthcare expert, nurses uh, and doctors on the front lines have been warning that something like this, this virus would come. There are many weaknesses from the lack of preparedness, PPE to ventilators, small hospital clothing, and lack of hiring much needed additional nurses. When it comes to the health of Americans, we deserve much better. All of us uh, lead to this very rapid uh, collapse, uh, collapse of our economy. We must now demand that our political leaders fix our health system and provide equality for all Americans, whether wealthy or poor. My guest for the show has worked on it as an organizer and an antitrust economist and co-founded Act on Mass, a nonprofit dedicated to activating grassroots organizations and votes uh, to hold uh, Massachusetts state accountable, accountable on the progressive issues. And it just so happens that uh, this uh, our guest today, Erica, is running for the uh, for state district Middlesex in Somerville and the 27th District. Erica Idaho, but welcome to the show. Good to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, yeah. One, one thing I want to mention today is I had my green on because I'm talking about Wizard Earth Day. Uh, actually, not today, it's mm -hmm. not, it was a couple days ago. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to, want to, this, this whole show is really circled around a lot of different things with labor, labor, climate change, and so many things that are going on. Can you tell me exactly? I, I know I mentioned that you're an anti, you were an anti trust economist and strategy consultant can you just give us yes. a, what is it exactly what is that um because it's, to your experience it said that the private sector uh and you work there and it's uh, these corporations have marginalized workers and control our environment can you tell me what that yeah. is yeah absolutely so um what i did as an antitrust economist is i analyzed with economic models the damages corporations cause when they break the rules of the market um, so just, you know, just to give a kind of sense of what that looks like for just to give a concrete example, right, is, um, for example, you have companies that collude, right, so they work together and they unnaturally raise prices on consumers. Um, and so as a result, people like you and me are paying more for a product that, in theory, a competitive market should have handled and lowered the price and, you know, uh, what, what is a, you know, efficient price for that? Um, and instead, they're actually cheating the rules of the market that are already sort of, you know, made in their favor. Um, I just want to add also just real briefly, too, that I... You know, working as a strategy consultant, I worked at um, BCG, or Boston Consulting Group. Um, strategy consultants are essentially hired to advise CEOs and managers of large corporations on how to make large changes to their corporation. So this can be anything from restructuring the company, layoffs, acquiring small companies. And I share with you, know, I share with you that these two jobs I did and how that's informed my work later on. Um, because concepts like corporate interests influencing our government, that term, to me, is an irresponsibly like, neutralizing way of what's actually happening, right? Corporate interest sounds like a theory. Um, it's like this vague, you know, force, and it's not because behind that curtain, there are these individuals making deliberate decisions that push working people to the brink of their existence in order for a very few of them to amass an inordinate amount of wealth. Um, and I've spent both in the same room as these people and in direct opposition of these individuals. And so a lot of that work that I did as an economist has informed the need that we need to fight for in our democracy and our government. Um, for that change and not have government be sort of a rubber stamp for for these interests right and these individuals i shouldn't say interests because interest sounds really neutralizing it's not they're, they're these are really deliberate decisions people are making well it sounds like your background certainly is uh, expansive on that on that matter there's no doubt about that uh it's, it should be very helpful uh, going forward uh so act on mass mm -hmm. last fall um you mobilized more than a thousand act on mass members and you successfully uh, to block 37 million dollars in corporate tax break from being slipped into the budget. Yeah. What, what, what exactly occurred? What is Act on Mass and what occurred there during this period of time with the $37 million in corporate tax breaks? 
Yeah, let me just tell a little story about this. So this was really one of our big wins and it was sort of an example of us catching um, the opposition red-handed, right? And so what happened last year, last fall, um, so two times a year, the legislature votes on a budget. Um, and what happened in October was the legislature released their budget that was to be voted on. Uh, they gave state reps five hours to read the 50 page bill pertaining to the IRS tax code. So it's a very complicated piece of material. Um, they had five hours to read it and file an amendment for it. So they were already rushing state reps onto like what to do about this bill, right? These are just rank and file state reps. Um, and they gave the public nearly just four or five hours to really respond to the bill itself, as well as the 96 amendments that were filed on this. And one of those amendments that we fought for and organized and, and helped draft, right, was this amendment that would remove this corporate tax break that was snuck into this budget. Um, and this corporate tax break essentially, um, it's, it's pretty complicated. Essentially what it does is IRS places a limit on how much businesses can deduct um, interest expenses. So this is particularly important for very large businesses. We're talking about, you know, 25 million dollars in revenue per year over over that right at least um, and they usually have you know subsidiaries across the globe um, and it's referred to as decoupling from the federal tax code that means that Massachusetts was going to remove itself from following what is the tax code guidelines in the in IRS um, and honestly this is something that's very rare only nine states have done it um, and they were trying to force the change on us so it was a very consequential tax break that would have had enormous implications and to be honest even when you talk to some of the uh, folks that analyze this sort of thing, they didn't know the, you know, the full extent of the consequences because that's how far reaching this tax break was. Um, and so we at SMS, given the limitations we had, we saw this coming too, because this is how things happen in the state house. They literally just tell reps a few hours in advance on what they can do. They can barely do much to, to react. Um, and the public is barely given enough time. I mean, there was virtually no press coverage before this happened. I mean, usually the press covers this sort of stuff after the bill has taken place because the vote has taken place because they can't respond. Who can write an article in five hours on something that we don't fully understand or what's going on? And of those 96 what's amendments, which ones matter and which ones don't? What were they trying to slip through, Erica? Uh, you said something was, they were trying to slip a mm -hmm. through. And we can't spend a ton of time on this, but what were like a couple of things they were trying to slide yeah. through? Um, so the, one of the things they slid through was this corporate tax break, which would have been at least a, a, a conservative uh, estimate was $37 million in our tax dollars that would have gone straight to some of the largest corporations. Um, another thing they also snuck into the budget, which is worth mentioning because we live in Somerville, is they changed the election date um, from September, uh, was it September uh, 15th to September 1st. Okay. Um, and as we all know in Somerville, September 1st is move-in day. So that's a really tough time for especially people who are tenants and young people to vote. And so that's another example of something they snuck into this budget. Um, and so the fact that it just it kind of highlights how undemocratic our, our state house operates, right? Just on that kind of like hour by hour basis. Um, and as a result, what Act on Mass did was not only did we fight to like keep the, you know, fix these problems, because we read through that 50 page bill. We said, here are the things we caught that they, they tried to sneak in. And then we also alerted all of our members and all our coalition partners, like this is happening, people need to call their reps right now. And so people got, I mean, we literally had people within that four hour windows calling their, their reps saying, this is outrageous. We are defunding the treaty, we're defunding our education and you're handing a corporate tax break to, to a corporate tax break to corporations? That's nuts, right? And so people sounds, sounds called like and actually as a result, we were able to block. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the revolution worked on that one. Yeah. <laughs> as, right, as, right, yeah, exactly. And that was that was something that was huge. Let me let me go. Let me move. Yeah, on. and that was huge because the. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna let them move on quickly, a little quicker if I could, please. Um, one thing, yeah. uh, your experiences with labor. I know that um, you have some personal experiences with labor and you and in unions. Uh, can you give me a little? Give me a little bit about what your experience is and how your feelings about about organized labor and labor in general. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a very personal issue for me in particular because my mom was part of a union and I watched how her and her colleagues effectively that trend from 40 years ago till now of carving out the American worker, busting unions, sort of that intentional push um, by the leaders of corporations to really just, you know, the, their way of essentially making things efficient was to carve out the American worker. I mean, stagnant wages, worse benefits. Um, and I think that that one has informed a lot of my work because I've sort of seen both sides of that, right? I've seen both like the, the decisions of those individuals um, behind that curtain, as well as the, the consequences that it has on working people. Um, and then to add to that, I mean, especially in Massachusetts, 
one of the things that's been really you know, a struggle for, for all of us and all working people is that the state house doesn't listen to unions, right? They do not prioritize our interests. Um, and that's been something that really struggles for fighting for public education funding, fighting to have a progressive tax code. Right now, the poorest people in our society pay the highest share of their income in taxes. That's just not right, right? I mean, that's just like, it's completely upside down from what people expect a fair tax code to look like. Um, and so those are all things that I've worked a lot with um, organized labor. And I think that comes to um, part of our work with Act on Mass. Um, people see us as like a transparency group, right? Like we're that watchdog that says, you know, raises the alarm as we saw with the corporate tax break. But there's another side of it too that's like doesn't quite capture that mission in East so fully. And that's the part which is around, um, we're trying to essentially change the culture of the state house, right? Change the rules, change what the way we engage. And for so long, they've said that, oh, you don't belong in the state house. By you, I mean organized labor, progressive activists, regular voters. Um, because by slamming bills through so quickly, you're basically preventing any sort of public engagement. And that's the case even with like, you know, bills that we've been advocating for, you know, these, this is an example of something they did something poorly, even for things that we need, they've been behaving this way. And so a lot of what Act on Mass does, particularly working with unions, I've trained dozens of union members on how to hold the state house accountable, how to make sure your voice is heard in the state house and how to properly advocate. Um, because if we're not making those hard asks, we're not going to get what we need. And in addition to that, breaking through, I mean, it's something that um, Alice Walker says, right, that um, the best way people lose their power is thinking they don't, they, they believe they don't have any. And that's sort of what's happened, right, with our, with our culture, um, especially near the state house. Labor unions need more representation, uh, not just from within and its own members. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs representation from its own yeah. members, um, because we have uh, had to turn to them on many occasions for their help. And uh, we're fortunate mm -hmm. to be in a state that is labor friendly, uh, in my opinion, uh, I've been around for a long time now, mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts, so I'm, I'm really, um, we're fortunate to be here, we could be somewhere else. One thing I do want to turn to is the pandemic, uh, and I want to talk about healthcare, yeah. and this is related to the whole labor thing. Um, with this pandemic, what are your thoughts on the pandemic? Because it's, the healthcare and preparedness has been so marginalized during this pandemic, and it's really stunning to yeah. me. What went wrong and why are our hospitals and healthcare providers taken by surprise on this whole thing? I mean, I don't think it's, obviously it may not be a surprise to some people. I mean, many people out there mm. are very surprised that we seem to be unprepared for this, not only here, but around the country. Yeah, no, and I think, yeah, and I think it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I don't think the nurses were surprised at all, right? They, they were one of those people, the canary in the coal mine saying this is a problem and that's why yeah. they fought for the ballot question. Um, last fall for safe staffing units, uh, or for safe staffing limits. Um, and I think um, what, well, how I see this crisis is, is two things. One, it's exacerbated and exposed sort of the structural problems in our society, right? For, so, for especially around our basic human rights. I mean, healthcare, education, housing, but we'll focus on healthcare in particular. The fact that we've been imposing a for profit model completely undermines them as human rights, right? Hospital executives and industry leaders have been pursuing maximum revenue, minimum cost. That means having as few as few nurses as possible, as few staffing as possible in their units. They kept insisting on having, you know, the least number of unfilled beds, the barest number of staff, right? Um, and that's what led to the, the crisis. And that's something I just want to highlight too with our healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, we pay the most out of any country per capita, right, per person. We are paying the highest bill and we are not just paying a little bit more. We're paying twice as much as our neighbors in Canada, twice as much as very similar countries yeah. um, like France, UK, you know, Spain. Um, and yet we have the highest death rate per hour than anywhere. We are number one in terms of deaths of COVID-19. Um, and these are tens of thousands of people who are dying unnecessarily due to this crisis because we didn't have any sort of structure in place to address this. And we don't have, we have a very confusing healthcare system, right? So my question, so my question is this, all right? So we, you, did t you did touch on this 2018 bill, uh, yeah. this question one, patient safety question. Uh, on the ballot in, uh, in mass. Yeah. And I interviewed two nurses from the MA at that particular point in time, and mm -hmm. the hiring of more nurses to staff hospitals. And as you know, it failed. Uh, and probably part of the reason was because there was a confusing question on the ballot, um, whether it be yes or whether mm -hmm. it be no. Um, I interviewed uh, President Donna Kelly Williams uh, about a week or so ago, and she enlightened me on many, many things as well. So mm -hmm. this is going to, this, this bill would have helped increase. Uh, nurses substantially yeah. in the hospitals. So my question is that, yeah. um, do you support um, to resurrect a question similar to this for patient safety? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think um, it's, and this is kind of comes back to like what my work with apps on maps, right? Um, we don't need experts in the state house trying to block us out and saying, no, you, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand the process. You're not a professional lobbyist. I trust nurses first and foremost on what's going on with our healthcare industry, right? I don't trust the hospital CEO executives. Um, they've never cared for a patient in their life into the, the room. They don't know what's happening. And the nurses do. Um, and they know that they're being overworked. They have an incredible caseload. Um, and this uh, ballot question in particular really highlights what is, is degraded in our democracy, right? Because this ballot question was the most expensive ballot question. The hospital, in, you know, the, um, the insurance and hospital lobby spent more than any other ballot question in Massachusetts history was on this question. So they lost partly because perhaps it was a, you know, a difficult, you know, difficult worded question, but also there was a ton of moneyed interest against them. And there was a lot of confusing narrative around it, right? Like, I mean, for example, the nurses came out saying, Nurses say yes on one. The oh. hospital you know, lobby came out with nurses say yes, no on one. Well, right? I, keep, I mean, they I literally just copied their you know, imagery. So. I, raised it. I keep raising yeah. this issue all the time on this. I know, you know it may sound like a broken record, but I just want to let people know mm -hmm. uh, about you know, where we are and where we could be going on this right now. The other thing is that you did raise an issue yeah. about uh, Singapore Medicare for all uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And saving $21 billion. Yeah. So I think in a condensed version, because this is expansive, obviously, we know that. Yeah. Um, what is it that you could, you could you, can you just let us know what it is? There's $21 billion, a lot of money to save. Where are we saving that money? Uh, and can we have yeah. something like a, I guess you could call it like a Romney care, uh, similar to Romney care mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, if the rest of the country is not willing to cooperate? Because obviously, it sounds to me like, you know, it's not really resonating with the rest of the country as much as it is in certain parts of the country. Right. Yeah, that's exactly, you hit the point exactly around Medicare for, for all. And that is something that we can implement at the state level. And actually, some of the most innovative policies, right, come from the state level. They get it later implemented in the federal level, but they start at the state level. Um, and Romney Care is an, an example of that. Um, and I don't think there's any exception with Medicare for all. And particularly, um, we've kind of got like a double-sided, you know, like pros and cons, like kind of advantageous and less advantageous point of Massachusetts in particular. Um, we're a state that can certainly afford it, right? Um, we have the highest GDP per capita than any state in the country. Um, and there is, and then there's a political appetite for it, right? People believe healthcare is a human right. Um, and we have also one of the highest costs of healthcare in the country is here in Massachusetts. We have some of the most financially insecure seniors, and that is largely driven by healthcare costs. Um, and so there's a, a very strong proposition. Mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt you, and yeah. I'll tell you why. I'll do that a lot. I apologize. Yeah. Where are we saving? Yeah, money? you're fine. <laughs> where where we're going to save this 20? I I think. Look at. In order for us to, yeah. to get someplace and, and know where we really want to be, and, and to get voters uh, mm -hmm. you know, lathered up about something like that. Where are we saving the 21 billion? Just yeah. give a couple of examples where that money would be saved. Yeah, that's a really great question. If people say, well, aren't my taxes going to go up? And that's scary. I can't afford to pay more taxes. Um, and I think the way I like explain it with people is like, we can't just think about taxes alone in its own siloed box, right? There's the money you spend on taxes, and then there's also money that you spend on healthcare. And that is where, you know, we as American people have been spending more than anyone in the, in the country, I'm sorry, in the world. Um, on our healthcare costs, right? I mean, we were just saying, you know, $450 per month just to get insurance. That doesn't get you care. That just says, okay, now you can go pay copays later, right? Um, and so that's, I mean, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's just like, I mean, that's just one, I'm throwing a number out there, but you know, it is like in the hundreds of um, dollars. Um, and you know, I would give an example, I, I studied in France for my master's because um, I couldn't afford going to school in the United States. Um, and that was an example where I did not pay that $450 a month for healthcare. It was free. And mm -hmm. sure, it was taken Co -pays. out of my taxes. So mm -hmm. what would happen? Would co-pays stop? Uh, deductibles, would they stop? Would, that save, would we be saving money in that way as well? Yeah, exactly. And that is the, that is a single payer model. I mean, that is the case for most developed countries that you go to see a doctor, we don't pay a dime. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, and that's kind of the idea with, with um, single payer healthcare, right? Is that we all share the risk across the board, across the entire country. Um, and we're not punishing people for getting sick, right? And that's, I think, the thing that's what's horrific in, our, in, in where, where we live right now is that people go into en enormous, we have one of the highest rates of medical debt in the country here in Massachusetts. Well, so um, and so people are I getting... Play, so I can play devil's advocate here. I want to talk about the insurance companies and the people that may yeah, be sure. losing mm -hmm. their jobs uh, because we bring in yeah. medical for all. And, uh, you know, there's a concern there. So there, there's yeah. an obstacle there. 
Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. So here's the part I, I'll, I'll tell you, the, and I think we can kind of apply a similar model to the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the workers who work at insurance company and making sure they're retrained and they have a different place to work afterwards. I'm not concerned with the, the corporate execs who have been making millions, hundreds of millions, right, off our healthcare system. It's true, the healthcare industry is gonna get much smaller as a result of this. I'm concerned about where are those workers gonna go? Do we have retraining programs to make sure? And it's the same exact model with the Green New Deal, right? We need to shift towards renewable energy. That means we need to also keep an eye on the workers who rely on the fossil fuel industry and making sure that they are going to be you know, shifted appropriately and humanely um, to other industries, right, through retraining programs. Um, and so that's where my concern is. It's not with the hospital execs who are making hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation a year. There, and, you know, that would be the counterpoint. That would be the, um, the, pro, the, yeah. the pros uh, and the cons of it and, and that. So I'd like to move on to something else right now, yeah. talk about the Green New Deal a little bit. Um, because uh, I guess uh, what we're hearing, and I'm hearing this from labor friends and climate change friends, and they're telling me mm -hmm. that a time for a Green New Deal uh, is needed. Now maybe yeah. a time, and, and can you just tell me why that would be now rather than you know, a year from now or two years from now? I know that, you know, yeah. is, I understand the urgency of it. Uh, how does the Green New Deal fit into what would help this, this, this current pandemic and future pandemic such as this? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two ways that it helps. I mean, one, there's the climate side and the other is the labor side, right? And so the climate side, um, it's incredibly important because the IPCC has given us 11 years to fix this problem. And we need to be making drastic changes to how our resources are allocated in our society. And that is the science is clear. And we are really just running at the end of the clock. There's that urgency. But there's another urgency too that we are especially living a gilded age, right, where so few have so much and so many have so little. Um, just basic fundamental human rights like housing is not secure. And it's about time we invested in affordable housing. We've been putting that, you know, we've been putting that off for, for decades now. That is, you know, the Green New Deal is an opportunity to build um, housing that is net zero carbon. Um, and in addition, we need a stimulus right now with the COVID-19 crisis, right? Right now, there's, you know, people aren't able to work. Um, and I mean, I, I'm saying though, know, this is an investment we take after it's safe to go outside. I want to make that very clear that we're, you know, we're not putting workers at risk. Um, but right now, with how the economy is and how it's been structured, we need a new deal, right? And it, it makes sense for it to be a green new deal because it's an investment into 100% renewable and reaching those goals before the time clock, the, the um, time runs out. And that also means making sure we have good unionized paying jobs, right? These are really, the really critical part is this is a jobs program too. It's not just about like, let's try to get to renewable energy um, through incentives. It is a jobs so, program. Hey, what, this, what you're telling us here is this, this, this tagline of racial, economic, uh, yeah. social justice, mm -hmm. by putting all of that together, it could translate into yeah. a healthier, um, healthier economy, mm -hmm. a healthier workforce. Um, and that's really what uh, if what, what I'm getting out of this, because um, I've always asked the question, and I think it means something to every, it's, it's like it's different to some of everybody else's. What's racial, social, economic justice? What is it? We, I think we all know what it is, but we all have different definitions. Mm -hmm. We believe it might be. Um, and that's, that's really- Yeah, cool. absolutely. Okay, so um, one of the other things I want to talk about is uh, some of the, there's so many people at high risk right now. Um, uh, we've heard stories of nurses, mm. uh, the masks, um, the, the dots, mm -hmm. the dots on healthcare and everything else is going on. I have a quote, uh, a view, viewpoint from one of the nurses on the viewpoint of the nurses at the bedside of uh, this outbreak. Like uh, COVID-19 is something that we have, uh, we've been concerned about for a very long time. Uh, this is Donna Kelly Williams. Yeah. Uh, and too many hospitals in the state have been operating with bare bones staffing uh, for years. And to provide nurses necessary. Mm -hmm establish safe standards across the board. So I, I think what I'm trying to get into here is that um, we are talking about this COVID-19 and the way that we can come up with, with a plan or the way that you're, you're discussing, and many people who I've talked to, come up with a plan with this Green New Deal to kind of tie this whole thing in, which is incredibly mm -hmm. important. Yeah. You know? um, so another question that I had too, um, that, that I thought was really important, um, was antibody testing. This is another thing that's coming up. Now, I don't, mm -hmm. this may not be your, yeah. your way you are. Um, you know, I don't know if, if, mm -hmm. what your background is on that. Uh, I'm not a bio, <laughs> not a bio student myself, 
um, the government has taken a very, very long time to roll this thing out and to get us back to uh, a semi-working um, mode where we can all exist. And I, I'm really mm -hmm. at a loss here to understand what's going on with this whole thing and the money that's needed to be spent um, because we're all really concerned about opening up uh, different parts of the country right now. Yeah. To get to get to get our yeah. labor world back. I mean, I listened last night to I think it was a mayor in Las Vegas, and it was just uh, one of the most bizarre interviews mm. I think I've ever heard about getting people back to work and in casinos and all these things that are going on. It's just I'm, it's I just couldn't imagine how that would how that would work for us and going forward in our new world. Um, so, what do you mm -hmm. think about testing, and how are we going to be able to get back to where? Well, I guess we may not get back to where we were, but how do we get back to a semi-normal, yeah. uh, new way of life before we can go back? What do we need? Yeah, to and I mean, I think. Yeah, and I think what we've seen from many other countries, right? The countries that have been able to slowly open up their economy again relied on massive amounts of testing, right? Because you need to know who has the virus, who they've been in contact with, make sure they're not getting in contact with other people. Um, that's really the only path we've seen in terms of like a reasonable timeline for containment and, and an opening up the economy again. Um, and I think one of the fears I have with, I mean, I have many fears about this crisis, but one of the fears I have is that there is this profit incentive, right, by people who are running corporations to push their workers back to work when it is not safe for them to do that. We've seen Amazon do it. I mean, how many warehouse workers are, are working on the job? They have, you know, co colleagues who have COVID-19 symptoms never been tested and they're still working. I mean, that is, I mean, that's outrageous, right? And that's putting workers' lives at risk over the need for making a profit and making, you know, putting our economy back on it. And so I think without these tests, we really can't, you know, the way we're going to be able to reopen the economy is going to be incredibly and slow, and, and we have to be incredibly cautious. Because um, mm -hmm. right now, I mean, even, you know, healthcare workers are refused tests. I, I'm not, I can't say about Massachusetts. I know across the state, uh, the country, there are many healthcare workers who have said, I have symptoms. I've been asked to come back to work. I mean, I know the New York nurses are on strike over this because they said they've been forced to work despite having COVID-19 symptoms. They can't even get tests. So not only are they sick and they're putting their lives at danger, um, they're getting, you know, they're, they're spreading the disease to other patients. And to add to that, right, there are countries where not a single healthcare worker contracted the disease. I mean, that's just profound, right? Let's just talk about the lack of preparedness we had compared to other countries. It's, it's, um, and we are putting, you know, in our healthcare. It's impossible. It's impossible for me to, to believe that we're the, we are, we're the greatest country in the world, richest country in the world, yet we're not mm -hmm. providing tests for yeah. everybody. And this is an opinion from me, for what yeah. it's worth. Uh, an antibody test, uh, asymptomatic. Yeah. Need to find out about that. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Um, and the, I, I think the government should be doing I know the government is testing people if you can get a test and it's not going to cost you anything. Um, but these are courageous frontline yeah. workers that are really currently working to keep us safe. Um, so I do have a real concern mm -hmm. about that as you do, um, because we all want to be able to have the ability to go back into our workplace. And we're not going to be, we're not sure yeah. that we're going to be able to do that. And so many plans have to be rolled out right now in order for us to get there. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's really concerning, yeah. right? especially for, I mean, I'm a municipal worker. Um, we have a lot of members mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have, you know, we're in 31 divisions and we're all over the city of some of them. So, of course, I know that they're going to do their best yeah. to make us safe. Uh, it's the rest of the country. It's the rest of Massachusetts as well. Uh, and this, this, is a, this is a prolonged yeah. lockdown, Erica. This is a prolonged lockdown if, if that's the way it's going. Yeah. You don't want to end up where we were. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think this is also another thing to note is that this is not a disease where if we do the right thing in Somerville, Somerville we're safe, right? Like we're all connected. Um, people move across state lines. I mean, this is not something where we can just do one state does one way and another state the other way. And I think that's one of the challenges right now, right, is that there's been this patchwork response. Um, we've had governors who, you know, instituted, instituted a state of emergency quicker than others. Many of others who are refusing to do it. I mean, that is really a huge concern because this is a disease that spreads. It spreads asymptomatically, right? You can be carrying the disease for up to two weeks with no symptoms. Um, and that's as a result, without testing, we don't know who's transmitting the disease and who's not, we can't contain it. And we can't reasonably or responsibly open up the economy or big parts of the economy again without having that kind of testing. Well, for the most part, I will say, and this is my personal opinion, I do believe that um, mm -hmm. our governor uh, is doing a very good job. Um, you know, I know the mayor, uh, Joe, Joe Tony. they're all, everybody's working very hard to 
um, do the best they can. Mm -hmm. and it's much appreciated. And I hope it can continue. One last thing before we, we close out. Um, what is, what's your feeling yeah. about, um, about municipal workers, and not just municipal workers, everybody, uh, and layoffs? And how, yeah. What can we do to preserve, and um, I know there's stimulus coming out of Washington. Uh, we already, we're already having some blips on the screen about that as well. Um, what can we do to have mm -hmm. our stimulus right here in Massachusetts in order to, um, you know, preserve what we have? And because and, people are really going to suffer. They're going to struggle. Yeah, no, that's a really great question, particularly around municipal workers, but all workers across the, the country. Um, you know, there is going to be a huge, I mean, we're seeing a 15% at least. I mean, this is a, I think, conservative estimate drop in our budget in the summer bill alone, right? And across, you know, municipalities across the state. Um, and so we're going to, and the, the other concern I have, and we've seen this over and over again with every crisis, the first people on the chopping block are workers. Right. We're cutting. That's the first people who say, you know what, you, we can't pay you a living wage. We can't pay, you know, we can't continue your work. We're just going to have to have people do double the work now and overwork themselves. That's always the first thing that cuts first. Right. Rather than all the other ways that our government spends its money. I mean, let's just, you know, and to just like put a plug there. I mean, corporate tax breaks is something we could be cutting, but we're not. Right. We're cutting the workers. And so I'm that's my biggest frontline concern is that the workers are going to be the first on the chopping block. And the second piece about it, too, is around what you just said about the federal stimulus. Right, because the federal stimulus has been largely going to large corporations with very little oversight. There's no guarantee that that money is going to make it to the workers of these companies. That would have been a different situation if they had done that and said, you know, you have to actually, you know, there's certain regulation around how you can spend that money and who gets that money. But that's not what's happened. It's largely been a giant check written to, to corporate executives. Um, in the absence of a federal response, right, the next line of defense for us is the state response. Um, and I say that because Somerville as a municipality, right, has a very limited mandate on how it pays revenue. So when we have a 15% hole in our budget, the only other way Somerville as a city can raise tax, can, can raise, make up for that revenue is raising property taxes. And that's going to hit people really hard. So mm -hmm. then the next question is, all right, who's going to make up for that gap? The state government has a much wider mandate to raise taxes. And I'm thinking, you know, I mentioned again, the corporate tax breaks. I mean, they make an enormous part of our budget, right? There's also raising taxes on their corporations doing very well right now. Amazon up until last year has been paying $450 in state taxes. That's as much as we spend on gas in two months, right? So those are all the things that we need to be forcing and pushing our state government to do. And so that we ensure that the state government is providing the aid that is needed for the city to continue to function. And the cities are going to continue. I mean, municipal workers in particular, right, are going to be on the front right lines of this crisis. If we need to like restructure our public buildings to be used for you know, emergency shelter, for morgues, for, you know, for health, for, you know, excess health capacity or healthcare capacity. I mean, we've seen that already happen in New York where they've had to convert public buildings um, into makeshift hospitals, right? Yeah. That's going to happen in Somerville. That's going to happen in our cities. Um, and we, we can't be at this time cutting the workforce that is going to make that happen. Um, we need to be ensuring that they're protected. Yeah. They're able to have you know, access to PPEs and we need to ensure that they stay, stay on the payroll. I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but I'm just, well, I guess what I'm saying is that we yeah. don't know what's coming, um, but we do have concerns about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you have, you have a yeah. lot of information. I appreciate uh, the information that you provided on the show. It's, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot. It's a lot. And uh, I'm going to have to watch this when we do this. Over <laughs> it's time so I don't to pick up on all the things that yeah. you said uh, in just a short period of time. Yeah. But I do want to thank you, Eric, for being on the show. Um, and it's, uh, it's a good experience uh, for us to have you on. Um, yeah. We're not talking about labor. Um, we're not trying to get political. Um, but I guess, unfortunately, during these times, pol political politics do come into it uh, because that's exactly what's going on mm -hmm. right now. And I do want to thank you very much for coming on. I also want to give you a shirt. And, um, you know, we, we, we will get this to you somehow. That's when we fight. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, this is the Summer Muslim Employees Association right there. Um, and we're proud of it. Oh, we're, amazing. Yeah. One of our matches. But I do thank you very much for being on. It's been fun for me. And um, hopefully we can have you back at some uh, particular point in time. And I'd like to wish you all the luck in the world. Remember, everybody, in unity and strength. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Myself is one thing I can do.